where'd you pick that up? <laughs> so, Brian, are we ready? Yeah. That's some sort of other supply chain. Oh, he's MIA. We can't start without the attorney? My last one came in six months, okay. so I don't know. I might so. be. I don't recommend that, though. Don't put the rush on. So we're, we're waiting for our city attorney to arrive before we can get started. He's coming. He's running. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So, um, thank you, City Attorney. Now we'll begin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Larry Schultz, your Vice Chair, and we're ready to start our meeting at 4:02. PM. So I want to welcome everyone here in person, plus uh, the commissioners and the city staff and our clerk. And I want to welcome those commissioners that are on the phone as well. I understand we have two commissioners on the phone. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, good. So uh, without further ado, we'll consider us called to order and then we'll begin with the roll call. So, Brian, can you take the roll call, please? Chair White, excused. Vice Chair Schultz. Present. Commissioner Sherman. Present via teleconference. Commissioner McCurdy, excused. Commissioner Armenian. Here. Commissioner Becker. Here. Commissioner Gabre. Here. Commissioner Niger. Here. Commissioner Breer. Here. Commissioner Aslan. Here. Commissioner Howard. Commissioner Keller? Present. Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Martin? Here. And Commissioner Zamora? Present on the phone. Thank you, we have quorum. Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, so now we'll move on to agenda item number two, and that is the uh, announcement regarding compliance with the open meeting law. Uh, Brian, are we in compliance? Yes, we are, Vice Chair. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move to item number three, public comments. Comments during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward and give your name for the record. The amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Is there anyone, pray tell, here for public comments? Being that there are no people here for that purpose, we will move on and consider agenda item three close and move on to agenda item four, which is a review of the final minutes from our last meeting held on June the 7th, 2022. So first I'll ask the commissioners if they have any uh, comments or uh, recommended uh, modifications or adjustments. Does anyone have any of those? Okay, then I'll invite somebody. I guess we have to have a motion to accept them. Hey, Larry, I'll, I'll move to accept the minutes. Okay. Now, um, Brian, do we need a second or can we just take a vote? Uh, Brian Kell, Deputy City Clerk, for the record. Um, we do not need a second on this Good. board. Thank you. So all those in favor of accepting the minutes as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, those minutes are accepted as presented. Vice Chair, through you, I have not heard the two uh, members on the phone for their, their, oh. their votes. Members on the yes, phone. Yes, I did say aye. Yeah, aye as well. Okay. Okay, now you guys on the phone, we're gonna keep an eye on you, so you better be voting whenever the voting time comes. We're watching. Okay, next, uh, we move on to the report by the Department of Public Safety. And um, Public Safety 
Officer, please step forward. We're anxiously awaiting your report with bated breath. Good afternoon. Lieutenant John Yin, Department of Public Safety. And I'm here to present the report for July. Let's see. Can you all see this? I think we all have a copy. We also have a copy, have a copy of the report, report as well. Okay, I'll start at the bullet points up top. For the month of July, there were four incident reports for graffiti or malicious destru destruction. It's about 4% of our reports for the month. And uh, speaking with our criminal investigation section, they said they've seen a decrease in graffiti, which they also mitigated by making some citations. Uh, throughout the last few months regarding this. So I think that made an impact on graffiti in the parks. F next bullet point, 57% of arrests, citations occurred in Ward 5, and 33% of citations occurred in Ward 3. Then the breakdown here by Ward, um, let's start at the top. We had 36 arrests across all wards. Those are misdemeanor arrests. Uh, we issued 65 misdemeanor citations three traffic citations, two felony arrests, and one juvenile arrest citation. Um, I'm gonna update this felony arrest to three uh, because our, uh, we did have a significant arrest that occurred for a felony. It was battery and substantial bodily harm. It was on a student at Hears Park who had his leg broken in a battery. And uh, our criminal investigation detective was able to um, uses resources and talk with the school and we're able to seek justice for that subject. We did arrest one subject in the commission of that crime. And um, I did speak with the father and he was very happy with our response to that. I'll start in this area right here. Top offenses was park violations. We had 70 and that's typically park closure and alcohol related offenses. And then our next category was outstanding warrants, followed by trespassing, narcotics activity, and then driving violations, traffic stops that occurred within the parks. Uh, top locations was Lorenzi Park, followed by Ethel Pearson Park, Justice Lovett Park, Fitzgerald Totlot, and then Stupak Park. And then we did have a community-oriented policing event that we attended at Rafael Rivera Park. And this is just a more drill down of all the offenses that occurred throughout July. And uh, most notable was uh, Justice Levitt Park. We had six misdemeanor citations issued out of there. And then two things of note for our department. We are redeploying our enduro motorcycles back out into the parks, into the trails. So you might see come across them um, riding around. This is mostly Monday through, I'm sorry, Sunday through Wednesday during the day shift hours. So they, they get into places that you know, a regular patrol car can't and they're able to engage with the public in a different level. Um, and then we're also next week, it starts the school violence initiative, which we're partnered with Metro, School PD, and other agencies. And uh, our role in that is uh, we keep an eye on the parks to keep uh, an eye on any children coming from parks that when they're amassing if they want to fight. So um, we're the eyes for, the, for that program for the parks. And if we do see something that's starting to look bad, then we can call in additional resources which all the other agencies have provided. And that's the end of my report. Thank you for your report. So I'll open it up now to the commissioners present here and on the phone for any questions or follow-up that they may have. Who wants to go first? Chair Schultz, Commissioner Sherman. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, I, well, first of all, I do want to congratulate Marshalls on addressing the prevention of violence by being a steady force there. The question that I had is, with the Clark County Ordinance passed with no criminals on the Strip corridor, I'm assuming that's just the Clark County end of the Strip, but I didn't know 
wondering if that will impact the mar marshals um, north of of. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat the the ordinance? Was that for Clark County? Yeah, it was a Clark, Clark County ordinance for um, no criminal activity. Anyone who was a convicted criminal, especially with drugs, was no longer allowed, or they could be asked to leave the strip. I think they just made it so that it could be any past criminal on the strip. I think it was yesterday, the Clark County. Oh yes, we don't have that ordinance on us on the books at this time for the areas that we respond to, notably Fremont Street experience. Lisa, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, thank you. I was just wondering if that would impact all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, other commissioners, uh, anyone else have uh, questions or follow-up? that's present, please go ahead and speak up. Okay, being no more questions or follow-up, you get off easy this month, huh? Thank you for coming and attending and briefing us and providing us that summary. And uh, I learned something new, that you had special motorcycles that you use only certain days of the week to get to areas that you normally can't get to. So I assume that you, some of that is at Floyd Land Park? Uh, that is one of them that we do. Yeah. Okay, well very good then. So we'll move on and thank you so much for your report. Uh, we'll move now to item number six. Steve, come on up. Uh, we're going to have a report regarding park maintenance updates. Thank you for coming, Steve. Yeah, so we, we have <coughs> quite a few projects in the, in the, in the um, in process right now. Not a lot of them are very photo ready, so we decided to pivot and talk to you guys today about this past weekend storm and, and our, our storm response. Um, so I got some photos here. So out at Floyd Lamb on Thursday night, um, the, the, the biggest impact Thursday night was out in the Northwest, mainly Ward 6. We lost one big tree at Floyd Lamb and several large branches came down. We lost um, two trees at Centennial Hills out in Ward 6. Um, that one was pretty scary and then um, Friday night the storm was mainly on the east side of town it mainly affected Ward 3 um, lost several trees at, at Levitt um, you can see that one we had we called out our contractor for and the playground shade actually got away unscathed so that was good um, we did lose 13 street trees on East Sahara as well as part of uh, part of that storm um, so all of this was ma mainly just wind damage, right? Um, didn't see a lot of flood damage in the park. We had pretty minor damage at, at um, J.C. Levitt with flooding. Came in off St. Louis and just flooded the skate park, but that was, we had staff and they cleaned that out. Um, now over at Mayfair Park in Ward 3, that's where we saw the most significant flood damage. Um, there was debris flow six to eight inches deep covering about 50% of the park. And we called in um, three staff members on overtime to clean it up the next day, and they, they handled it all in one day. You can see the, they just washed the top end of the park all the way to the bottom end of the park out wow. into the street. You can see. Well, and that's all cleaned up. No, there's a lot of activity. Yeah. It's not good activity. Yep. Hmm. So yeah, that's, um, that's what we did. We were able to handle most of it with, with staff that was scheduled over the weekend. Um, we did, like I say, call in three people on overtime and then use the contractor for some of the larger tree um, removals that took place. So. Any questions? Thank you, Steve. Yes, go ahead. Commissioner Howard. Um, on all of this damage that was done, I know we don't get very much rain on a regular basis. However, are there any plans on trying to redirect the water flow to some of the more damaged parks? Um, the when it does know, the, rain like the, this? The only one that was really effective was Mayfair. And I know that Streets and Sanitation is working on, on where that water goes. Um, 
but I don't, I don't know what their actual solution is, so. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. Commissioner McCurdy. Commissioner McCurdy, Ward 5. Uh, I have some issues with uh, Doolittle. I, I have people come into my house, because I live right across the street uh, from Doolittle, and they come by talking about the homeless having camped up there on the walking track. And uh, so Doolittle needs some more uh, personal attention to its hygiene and cleaning up uh, around Doolittle and even around the senior citizen building. I've had senior citizens come to my house and complain about uh, the uh, cleaning of, you know, around the uh, senior citizen building also. And I'd like to have your number so I can start directing people to you. Okay. okay. And uh, that to you. my number is 702 204 4121. 702 204 4121 and give me your name and everything. And I'm not going to really have them to call you, but I want to be able to call you to uh, get you to do something. I like to have the schedule when Doolittle is cleaned up, especially around that track and around uh, the senior citizen facility. Okay, we'll do. We can get that to you. Go ahead. Commissioner Keller here. I have a question. For the trees that were completely taken down uh, through the storm, do, is there a plan to get those replaced or will that go into kind of next year's funding or future funding? No, they're, that's, they're all part of our tree inventory and they've, been, they've already been marked as removed and a vacant site that's ready for planting and planting will probably, any, any replacement we do will happen this fall. So, so just a, a follow up on that question from Mika. So when you replace them, you, I assume you're not replacing them with the same mature size. It's, no. So what do you put, like 36-inch box or something? Um, yeah, our standard is a 3 to 4-inch caliper out in the park. So that, that usually equates to a 36-inch box or sometimes a 45-gallon yeah. container. So when we lose a mature tree like that, that's a major loss. It is. It yeah. takes years to get to that stage. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? Uh, Questions from the commissioners? Yeah, uh, yes, Chair Schultz. This is Commissioner Sherman. Yes, go um, ahead. Lisa. First of all, I want to congratulate Mr. Glimp as well as Mr. Ford and the entire department. Las Vegas was named the best city for recreation with the most parks per square foot, and I think that's a real feather in the cap for the department. I want to congratulate everyone on that. I also want to ask Steve Glimp, are you guys still doing the Memorial Tree Project? Uh, Steve Glimp, Superintendent of Parks. Yes, we, we still, we still ha do that program. Um, it, the Mayor's Fund, it, that's actually, it's, it's um, through the Mayor's Fund now. So all those, all those memorial applications go through that website. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Steve. Anybody else? Okay, Steve, thank you so much for the update report. And sorry you've had to have all this, what I call, work related to weather catastrophes. It's not, that's not the fun stuff. <coughs> no, nope. keep thank us on you. Your toes, though. Okay, we're moving on now to agenda item number seven, which is a presentation by our director, um, Ford, for emerging issues regarding our department. Welcome, Steve. Good afternoon, Commissioners. For the record, Steve Ford, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs. Uh, since our last meeting in June, there have been some changes to our organization. With the resignation of the Director of the Office of Cultural Affairs, the decision was made by the City Manager to merge the two departments. Uh, and so as of July 1st, we are now known as the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs. Cultural Affairs Division of our department will be overseen by Ms. Maggie Plaster, who is the Deputy Director of Cultural Affairs and will remain in that position. Uh, this merger gives us a real opportunity to expand some program offerings uh, to the community in a synergistic fashion so that we can provide more uh, complete um, uh, programming opportunities for the members of the community and I look forward to learning this part of the uh, city operation. 
Uh, also at the meeting of June, in June I was asked to prepare some information for the commission. And uh, first is an update on the current capital project. Make sure I get the right button on this. Uh, the current uh, uh, capital project, improvement projects currently in pre-design, design, or construction. So this document is the one at your desk, so I'll just go through it rather quickly and then have questions at the end. So in Ward 1, we have On Sound Sister Park upgrade, the Charleston Heights Arts Center. We've got various things going on inside the center itself. Uh, the Mirabelli Lieburn Center Perimeter Wall Park upgrade, Cragen Park Soccer Field, and the Oki Ranchi, o Oki Rancho Dog Park construction. Those are the, you can uh, see the, the descriptions, brief descriptions of all of those, an estimated cost, an estimated completion of when those projects will be done. Uh, just to note that some of these projects at this time, this time are only funded for a design level. Um, in order to maximize cash flow, basically we will fund design in one year, construction in the following year. So some of these are only funded for the design. I tried to make a note of those, but I may have missed a couple. <coughs> so that's Ward 1 and Ward 2. Excuse me, Steve. Yep. Before we move on, can yes. we just stay with Ward 1? So when it says TBD, I, I may have just missed what you said. I was trying to look at this at the same time. TBD on the schedule, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Well, Craig and Park right now is, um, we have, a, we have a design for it, and it was actually submitted for SNPLMA funding round uh, 19, and we are waiting to get that determination to see if that was going to be funded for the, fir for the full construction amount or not. So until we determine that, we don't know exactly when the estimated completion is going to be. So basically, it's a funding constraint. Correct. It's on the plate, but it's not moving forward unless funding is received. Correct. Okay, and, and, and as far as these grants that you're requesting, what is, what, what's the normal window when, the, when you'll know one way or the other? <laughs> that is a great question, uh, Commissioner Schultz. So the, these, the, the SNPLMA, the, um, and for those of you, I'm assuming that most of you know, but if you don't, the SNPLMA is Southern Nevada uh, Lands, um, SNPLMA, uh, Lands Management Act, uh, funding through the BLM. And so it takes roughly a year from the time that we actually submit a project until we know it's going to be funded. And then it actually can take up to another year after that to get the actual agreements through the BLM process. So from the time we submit a project uh, to get it all the way to actually having dollars in hand could be up to two years. And are we on that cycle of up to, up to two years, mm -hmm. are we at the front end, middle end, or, or the end end? For round 19, we're, we're uh, sort of kind of in the middle. We should know if we get funding uh, toward the end of this year, and then after that we'd work on the agreements. So, so we're really talking about realistically maybe starting in 25? Yes. Okay. Correct. So these are out there. These are these could be out there. Yes. Sir. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Continue. Sure. Going on to Ward Two, um, we were funded this year to do some synthetic turf replacements of our soccer fields. We have a full schedule on when all of our synthetic turf soccer fields uh, and sports fields will be replaced. Um, they last about eight years, and Mr. Glimp and his uh, group have put together a pretty good um, site cycle of when all of these will be due. And so this year we're going to be uh, replacing those as, as shown. The Darling Tennis Center 10-court expansion, we have a funding uh, just for uh, basically a conceptual design to see if we can fit 10 additional courts and how they would fit out there. That would be another uh, potential uh, application to st for SNPLMA funding for the actual construction. So that's a couple of years away, but we are looking at how we can expand that tennis center to include more courts. The Veterans Memorial uh, locker rooms and restrooms in Veterans Memorial are, is in design right now to upgrade the restroom. And we're going to change the front of the center around a little bit to make it a little bit more uh, not only customer friendly, but more usable for staff. Uh, wards two and three, of course, we've still got, uh, we've got both uh, wards that have the synthetic turf 
uh, that will be replaced. Uh, Ward 3, we've got quite a bit going on. The Chuck Meeker uh, Master excuse, Plan. Excuse, excuse yes, I'm sir. Sorry, can we go back to Ward 2? So on Ward 2, the last project, you have this SMPLMA pending, but yet you have a time cycle. How is that for completion? How would that be different than the other ones when you have pending uh, grant issues? Which one? At the bottom of pit Ward 2. Oh, does that? Okay. It may not be shown up on my screen. Yeah, see the copy that we. Oh, have there it here? is. Okay. Yes, see, sir. We have Sorry. Co our copy is okay. different than what you have. So on this one is a little bit different um, uh, because this one was actually round, uh, round 18, and we have received, actually received funding for that one. Um, we, we, have, we, have been, we have been approved for funding. And now we're in that cycle where it takes up to a year or so to get the actual agreements to have funding in hand. So this was the previous round of Stimplema applications. So this is more mature. Correct. Okay, I'm sorry. That's Go okay. The, 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 the zoom on my screen down here doesn't get to that well, last one. Yeah, so. the, I, yeah, the one we have actually has more detail than what you have here. Yep, I've got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, synthetic turf. Uh, ward 3, so Ward 3 we have the Chuck Winker Master Plan that um, we had a, a pot of money that we put together to determine what we need to do or what we should do with the Chuck Winker Sports Complex. Uh, the, the consultant developed three options for us, the renovate the existing, add on to the existing or tear the Minker uh, Sports Complex down and start over. They've just just recently completed that, and so now we're evaluating the best way forward for that particular uh, facility. Hundred Circle Park, uh, again, the consultant is uh, supposed to give us three conceptual designs. As many of you know, we've had a pretty large neighborhood meeting about that. The uh, consultant is still working on those designs with the, with the Ward 3 office. Uh, Martinez uh, and Hall Pool Lifeguard Building, that's in, de in design right now to uh, put, actually put a roof on that and, and add a HVAC system. East Las Vegas Community Center is almost complete. The rehab of the interior, there's going to be an outstanding uh, mural on the north wall of the building that faces Stewart. And then the East Las Vegas Family Dog Park is uh, a three-cell dog park that is currently in design. And then the Harrison Marion Park is under construction right now with the, so with the uh, estimated completion right after the first of the year. Any questions on Ward 3? Yes, sir. Uh, Harris Marion Park? Yes. Is, where is that at? That is at Marion and Las Vegas Wash that uh, Robison, Robison Middle School is right across the street. Robison, Robison. Um, and it's uh, right on the edge of the wash. I'm working with the Ward 3 office right now on what the name of that park is actually going to be. And I am hopeful that I will be able to bring that at our, to our next um, meeting for your recommendation on the uh, recommended name for that park. And then we can go to, to council. Any other questions on Ward 3? Ward 4 will be uh, removing, replacing the fence at the Gringo Hills Golf Course. We have money for the Majestic uh, Ball Field Rehab to re rehabilitate the, the fields. The Regional Pickleball Complex, or the Regional Aquatic Center, is uh, that's the, the one that is uh, we just discussed is that's that this one is actually uh, Ward Two, so that that one is uh, incorrect in Ward Four. That's in Ward Two, the that we already discussed, and the regional pickleball complex is also pending Stimplema, uh decision on whether we are moving that location from Wayne Munker Park to the new location down the street at uh, on Centennial. The Police Memorial Park is uh, currently under con or currently in design. We met with uh, Mayor Pro Tem last week to 
finalize the scope of what's going to uh, be included in that uh, rehab. And then, of course, we have the canine memorial, uh, the police canine memorial that will be installed. That was funded by donations from the uh, Southern Nevada Law Enforcement Group. And we're hoping to have that one done in the first quarter of 24. Any questions on Ward 4? Um, yes, uh, Director, I sure. have uh, two questions. Hmm? Uh, any chance on the majestic ball fields that the uh, other amenities could include a flagpole? A flagpole? Yeah, there's never been a flagpole at that particular park at Majestic. We can make that happen. Great. I've been asking that for that one for a while. And then just as a, a point of interest, it, I, I think there's just softball fields there. There's no baseball field. Correct. It's all okay. softball. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, Ward 5. Uh, several big things going on in, in Ward 5. The Dulo Campus Master Plan, the uh, Here's Park upgrade that I'll, I'm just now working with the, the Council Office to determine that scope and some of the options we're looking at there. The James Gay Park Master Plan, the Lorenji Park Court Expansion. That one is uh, one that we've just funded for design, which we uh, have also submitted for SNPLMA funding. We're replacing the water well at Lorenzi. The <laughs> existing water well has failed. We are using potable water to water the grass at Lorenzi, which is not cost effective nor advisable <laughs> in, in the conditions we find ourselves in. But uh, the well has is, is fa completely failed, and so we'll be replacing that. Uh, the Dulo Pool Condition Assessment is about finished. We had some uh, issues that we were discovered after we started construction. So that's taking a little bit longer than expected. And then uh, one, of the, one of the newer things that I'm now involved in with the Cultural Affairs Group is the Westside Museum Performing Arts Center, which we have an RFP on the street right now to find somebody who can master plan and program and see what we need to build and how we build it uh, for that Performing Arts Center on the west side. Any questions on Ward 5? Yes, sir. Um, where is, is that the existing art center that you're talking about redoing? No, sir. Where is the new one you're talking about building then? The Historic West Side Museum and Performing Arts Center right now, um, I don't think a, a location has been 100% determined, which is part of this whole plan on where, where how, and uh, what, it would, what it would look like. So to my knowledge, and again, I'm just getting in on this one because this is a new, this is part of the cultural affairs group that I just in, uh, inherited. Um, I don't think that there's been a location absolutely firmly established for that. Do you know if this can be part of the uh, Clark County, Las Vegas library district? <laughs> that you're talking about building, taken from Doolittle to taken to Martin Luther King. So is that some of the same uh, same uh, pot of ground? Yeah, no, sir, I, don't, I do not believe, to my knowledge, that the Performing Arts Center would be in, the, in that same area where the new library will be built. So that means there's a possibility to stay at the Doolittle campus. I don't think it was included in the Doolittle Campus Master Plan. That's, I, I'm not, like say, Commissioner McCurdy, I'm not really certain where this is going to be. I know there's been some locations discussed, but I, this was not included in the Doolittle Master Plan um, program. What locations, I know the city owns a lot of land mm -hmm. in the, the historic west side. So I'm trying to figure in my mind, since I live in the historic west side, what area of uh, potentially that you guys have been looking at? Well, uh, Commissioner McCurdy, if I could, could I get back to you on that? Because I, I really don't want to misspeak, and I'm, I'm not certain at this point. Okay, you can get back to me. Uh, I'd just like to know, me and uh, my counterpart, we'd like to know kind of what's going on. Yes, sir. Any other questions on Ward 5? Uh, 
Commissioner Gabriel. Good to see you uh, there, Tuesday. Uh, it's about the Hayes Park upgrade. Yes. Hayes Park, it looks like a soccer field. Mm -hmm. What's the upgrade going to happen there? Is that going to be recreation? What's going to so, kind of upgrade? So here's Park. We did a, we did a, uh, the community survey on that, and it was uh, extremely well received. We had almost 500 responses from the community on what they'd like to see there. So we took the, f the top four or five uh, items, a walking path, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, but I, we, I'm working with, with the Ward 5 office to determine what we want to see and put together a couple of different conceptual plans to see what that would look like, and then I think uh, Councilman Creer is going to have either a neighborhood meeting or an online poll or something that would put that back out to the community. Um, I don't think at this point in time that it was going to be a an organized soccer field, like you would see an organized soccer field in most parks, that was uh, that actually did not rank really high. I know things like a splash pad ranked high, mm -hmm. um, the walking path ranked high, uh, fitness court, fitness type things ranked pretty high in that particular area. So, the uh, again, if with uh, your permission, I'd like to get back to you on that one because we are working with Ward 5. I had emails with, with Harry today about getting together with the councilman to determine what that's going to look like. Thank you. Harry, okay. Yes, sir. I'd like to go back to again. Um, you said there's issues have came up in the rehabilitation of the swimming pool. That's correct? Yes. And you're talking about putting seventy-five thousand dollars in the rehabilitation of the swimming pool. That was the yes, sir. 750, oh, seven hundred fifty thousand. So is, is that going to add my uh, roof over that? That will not have a roof over it, sir. <laughs> I try. Okay. Uh, moving on to Ward Six. The Centennial Hills BMX bike park um, that's going to be at Centennial Hills right there at Buffalo is in design. We are replacing uh, another well at Floydland Park. This is the well that actually feeds the ponds that is uh, not yet failed but is on, a, on the verge of failing. So we'll be replacing that. The shooting range remediation is an ongoing project. That's going to be a long-term thing. We fund it a little bit at a time as we, as we move along. Okay. May I ask before yes. you move on? Mm -hmm. First of all, on the failing well, mm -hmm. um, as part of your program, do you have some sort of metering uh, uh, equipment, or how do you determine the failure? Is it basically you have a flow rate that you expect, and then the flow rate decreases? What is the actual indication of the failure? So there's a there's a couple of things that we do or can do. Uh, one is the flow rate. One is how much silt it's producing. One is we know that it was an old well, and so we'll camera, send a camera down, and we'll see that the, uh, the sheathing is starting to deteriorate. So there are a couple of, <coughs> couple of issues, and we know that this is an old well. The one that we just replaced, which was the potable well, was, was installed roughly the same time, and so we have an idea what the condition is. So we're, instead of waiting for it to completely fail, we're trying to be proactive on it. Okay. And just out of curiosity, in the city parks, how many wells do we have for irrigation, roughly? Oh. I mean, is it more than 20, or is it? Oh, no, no, no. We have, there's just four wells thousand. at Floyd Lamb, three wells at Ed Fountain Park, one well at Lorenzi. Okay, so something like 10 or so. I think we have, yeah, maybe 10. And, and you, the program involves inspection of these wells on a routine basis then? Mm hmm Okay. Yes, sir. And the next one question I have is um, the shotgun range. Yes. So i actually be honest with you, I wasn't even aware Floyd Lamb had ever had a shotgun range. <laughs> is this some sort of legacy facility? Yes. Yes, sir. So the, the Floyd Lamb uh, shooting range has actually been operational, from my knowledge, the, from the research I did, from at least the 50s. Um, and it was a 
it was one of the premier shooting ranges in the Southwest. It had spaces for probably 15 or 20 RVs that had hookups that people would come and have the, they'd have national competition shoots out there. And so when the, when the city took it over from the state in about 2009, right shortly after that is when the Clark County shooting range opened. And the agreement was when that opened, we would close down this range. And so uh, in, that, in that interim period, uh, from now, from then till now, uh, we really didn't have many plans for it. And so now that we've, we're, we're looking at it, we have a, an action plan with the State Devo Department of Environmental Protection on how we're going to treat the soil. And it's, it's surprisingly not the lead contamination from the shotgun shells, from the shot, it's the clay pigeons. The clay pigeons have a, have a uh, polycyanate uh, makeup to it that's very deep right now and uh, transported into the soil. And so we're, we're taking little sections at a time to remediate that. Yeah, so that's what, when I was reading this, I was looking at it from just understanding how there can be a deposition of lead mm -hmm. when generally at a shooting range, the lead is cleaned up routinely. Which, the, and, and the, the prior operator did a pretty good job of doing that. Yeah. About every year they would go out and actually mine the lead. Um, and so there, there are a couple of areas of high lead concentration, uh, mainly where they did the mining. But the, 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 big, um, the big problem is the actual clay pigeons. And that I, that I had not even thought of. But that's a different type of con contamination. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, the Northwest Regional Park, uh, again, around 19, Sniplum appending for $24 million. That is uh, just what we're calling Phase 1A of the park. We uh, are actually applying for a lease of 160 acres up in that part of town. And this is going to be a very small portion of that. I actually got to uh, brief this with the Sniplum Executive Committee and the, the Nevada State um, Director of BLM on what we're doing, there's uh, the old railroad um, maintenance yard up there that we're going to maybe not reconstruct, but at least give homage to, and that's going to be the basis of this park, is the old railroad, um, old railroad yard up there. So that's uh, we're we're really excited if we can if we can get this. It, the the Sniplema has actually made it through the first round, which is the local round, and then it goes to the to the federal round for funding. The, we're, we're just really hopeful that this is going to, that, that we'll receive funding for this one. Uh, the next one is the Floyd Lamb Hay Barn restroom. We're, we're constructing a restroom right next to the uh, historic Hay Barn. And then, um, oh, the Majestic Field Rehab, again, that's Ward, uh, Ward 4. So with that, is there any, any other questions? Oh, please. Yes, sir, oh, Commissioner well. Niger. Um, these wells, are they failing due to equipment or a, a drying up of these groundwater tables? Age. Age? Age. It's, uh, it's the, the uh, screen on the inside is starting to fail. Um, the, the, the side walls are collapsing. It's, it's strictly age. Yes, ma'am. So quick question. This is um, uh, Ward 4, Audrey Aslan. A um, couple things. I noticed on when you're talking about the SNPLM appending for the Northwest, that's mm -hmm. the 24 million, and you go back to wards two and wards four, those are also SNPLM appending. Are those out of round 19 or a, a different round? Because uh, those are 13 million a piece. So round, so the regional pickleball complex in ward four, Is that, that, that was round 18. That was one previous. So you already you've already got that locked. In. We we have we have that one. Locked in, we've received approval for it, but now we're asking for the location change. Oh, I see. That's why that one's pending. Okay. So we're we're just waiting on the decision from the executive committee on if we're going to change that location. Gotcha. Okay. And on the wells, I just had a quick question on Lorenzi. Since you're, um, I believe, um, when you're close to a uh, water district or um, any other entity that mm -hmm. provides water, you're, su you're not supposed to re-drill that. Is that something that you guys have a pre-approval to dr 
for water rights or something? We, we have. We have the, we have the water so rights. you don't have to hook into uh, city water. Correct. Okay. We, have the, we have the water rights. We have received permission from the state engineer. We're, we're all solid on that. Gotcha. So, and then finally, we've got uh, under all wards just some ongoing projects. We're doing some upgrading on sports fields. Uh, we've got some ADA upgrades that we, we use this as we find ADA issues that we have with some money set aside to address those things. And then uh, park area lighting, which is different from the sports field lighting, that we can do those upgrades as well. And that's just kind of an ongoing, an ongoing project. And uh, that should be it. If there are any other questions. questions? Go ahead, Melody. Commissioner Howard, I want to talk about these dog parks. Uh, <coughs> what exactly does that involve? Because currently most of our dog parks, all it is is a piece of land with some fencing, maybe a tree. So, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Okay. On, on most of the dog parks that I've seen so far, it's usually just some fencing with maybe a tree that separates like the smaller dogs from the larger dogs. And I'm noticing it's like $1.6 million dollars for a two or a three section. Uh, what all is, is it going to just, does that include the price of the land? No, so uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the one on East Las Vegas. Both, and, Bo and Ward 6, or not Ward 6, Ward? Ward 4. 4. So the, the I'll address Ward 4 first. So the dog park at, uh, or excuse me, Ward 1. Sorry. The Oki Rancho just, dog not park. not complaining, I'm just curious. No, so. Yeah, a lot of it is, is just fencing. Um, the Ward 1, I'll address separately because we are doing something special for the councilman there. We've got uh, some artwork going in. He wanted it to be more of a, of a plaza type dog park as a, as a walking destination. So we've got some artwork going in on that as well. The one at uh, Ward 3 at East Las Vegas, that one is does not include the price of the land, but there's a lot of dirt work okay. that's going to be included in that. So there's going to be leveling and everything. The dirt work and the utilities. Okay. I was just curious. Thank yeah, you. I understand. Uh, other commissioners, any questions? Go ahead, Steve. Commissioner Niger again. I'm talkative today, sorry. That's okay. Um, Question, everybody's talking a lot about water. I, I see some turf removals being replaced with synthetic. I, I am aware of the heat issues and the you know pet urine issues. And I'm curious, obviously the rule coming out just has to do with ornamental turf, which means it doesn't apply to the parks. Mm -hmm. um, but I also don't want to assume that the, the, uh, the city is not trying to be proactive about saving some water where they can. I know that I saw they're replacing some fields um, for soccer mm -hmm. with synthetic. Um, can you kind of tell me what the position is right now in which which types of fields in terms of sports can can be used with synthetic replacement, which can't, those kinds of things? Well, the everything that, we're, that we have synthetic, everything you see on this is replacing existing synthetic. Uh, we're not replacing any any natural turf fields yet. We don't have that many natural turf fields left. So um, and pretty much any of the field sports, uh, football, lacrosse, um, can be played on on synthetic turf. Those are the, the, the big ones that we have. Um, we are, and you are exactly right, we are doing our best to remove non-functional turf. Um, for example, the uh, Police Memorial Park, we've got a substantial amount of turf that's coming out just to um, that, that can be used for anything else. It's just non-functional turf. So we are replacing uh, and, and going through systematically to try to find turf that's in a parking lot, for example, or right around a park that can't be used for anything. We are trying to go through and, and replace all of that. And we're working on a general MOU with uh, the Water District right now to, to kind of expedite that. Anyone else? So um, let me just uh, ask a couple of general follow-ups. First of all, does this uh, represent all of the capital projects the city's working on in the parks area? This represents probably 99% of them. Okay, so there's 1% maybe. There, there's, a, there's a few out there, and it, it's a little bit complicated, uh, Vice Chairman. The, uh, the council in FY23 were, they were given each a million dollars to spend as they saw fit. 
and a lot of them spent on other items, but a lot of those came back as projects to us to do. So though we're trying to, to fix those in. I'm still trying to get the full scope of those projects. And so those I did not list because I don't really know what they're going to be yet. Um, but they are out there. We're, there's things that we'll be working on. So that's in the evolutionary undefined phase. Th that's what we call the pre-design phase. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and I understand what your explanation. The next question I have is really for the commissioners. So I know we've had this update at least prior to today once or twice, but I don't remember it prior to that. Some of the people here who've been here much, much longer than me may remember it. But in any event, since this uh, area of capital projects, which is quite important, tends to change often over time, mm -hmm. either projects get funded that are not funded right now, or projects are complete, or new projects are added, or the evolutionary pre-designed stuff is defined. For the commissioners, how often would you like to see this updated? What is your opinion? Is this an annual thing, a semi-annual thing? What is your view? Go ahead. Um, Commissioner Aslan. So, this is a good question, and I had this thought earlier. I know in the past, um, previous director, he had mentioned about a database and how we would do condition assessments on these parks and assets and that we would create work orders mm -hmm. and there would be a backlog of deferred maintenance. And so one of the things that's not captured here is what that backlog of deferred maintenance is compared to the capital improvements. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, because I work in this arena, I kind of understand that this language and, and how to manage a park. Um, but I've never really seen the detail behind how you select projects. So, for example, you do an assessment on an asset, it comes back, you have work that needs to be done, it can't be done this year, it gets deferred, then it goes onto a list and somehow that's scored and each commissioner, you know, wants their park worked on, especially some of the older ones. How do you make that determination? And how, where is that list? And how long is that list compared to this list? Because this is considered, this is not all capital improvements. This is both, right? Right. This, this is capital improvement, correct. But it also has some rehabilitation and correct. replacement. So that's a deferred maintenance, I mm -hmm. believe. So, so, the, so that's been on my mind the last couple meetings. And I know we talked about it in the past, and it mm -hmm. never really got readdressed. And I don't know if that's something that the other commissioners want to see, but I know in looking at deferred maintenance, that needs to come first. We need to take care of the assets that we have before we build new assets, and that's always a con conflict because the more things we build, we don't get more funding to maintain it mm -hmm. or replace it, you, and you have the same staff. So I, kn I know those, those pains of managing. So um, anyway, I was just curious about all those things. If you could address that. Okay, so so I'll try to take it one at a time. Um, development of new projects. Usually that comes from the council member. We, we work with them on what they want to see in their ward. Uh, we do do, we do do, we do have a, uh, an assessment program and we are funded actually the last couple of years we received uh, what we call a capital asset replacement. So things like shades, uh, the shade structures, playgrounds, uh, walking path stuff. We have a, a funding source to do that as we, and we try to, to systematically go through the, the parks and look at that, obviously doing the, the, the worst ones first. Um, so that's, that's how we, we work on the, the replacement of assets or the repair of assets. Uh, for park rehabilitation, again, it's really, the as we as we go through um, the life cycle of a park, a Majestic Park is a great example of that. Majestic Park is a beautiful park, but it hasn't been had a full rehab of the fields since it was constructed in 2009, 2010, whenever it was constructed. So we we do that and, and look at if it if it's a, an asset that we think is going to be beyond what we have for the replacement costs, and we put it in as a, we, we recommend that as a project to the council office. 
so there's not really a, a, a deferred maintenance backlog list of just things generally speaking. We, yes, we, we do. We, yeah. we have that. that. That's on our, that's, that's from, from what I understand, that's on our, our asset replacement thing, uh, our asset replacement list for that capital project. And we, have, we, we do have quite a list of that, a, a list of those things to replace. And what we've done is look at it, we'll do a, like a five year look ahead. Okay, so right. this year we have these things that need to be replaced. Um, the the playgrounds at the end of its useful life, the walking tracks at the end of its useful life, the soft surface underneath the playground uh, got destroyed, it's full of holes, whatever, so we'll need to replace that. So we try to do that as, on a five year look ahead. So is that communicated to the commissioner so that they understand that, that components are being replaced so that, that you know? We can, we can provide that, yes. I mean, I don't know if they want that, but I just think it communicates that um, there's more projects than what's on this list. Oh, yes, there's so. considerable more. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, very good. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, well, thank you for that. So other commissioners, as far as frequency of this report, I mean, we just added another dimension, but in addition, or aside from the other dimension, this is sort of a core of what's been authorized and what's on the plate. 99%. How often do you all want to see this? Vice Chair. Uh, Commissioner Becker, uh, Ward 2. Um, I'd, I'd like input from staff to see like what would, you know, I mean, I'd like, I could just throw out quarterly, but I'd like to have input from staff to say like, when is it worthwhile for the commission to receive that kind of information? And also at the same time, I don't want to create an extra workload for you that's not necessary if you don't think that things are moving. Like we don't, if there's no movement, we don't need to see this list again right. in a couple months. But if there is movement, then of course we do. Thank you, so that's a, that's a great point. So my recommendation would be um, at, the, at the beginning of the fiscal year when the projects have actually been approved as capital improvement projects by the city council, we can bring all of those forward to do it. So that would be July, this, like th this time frame, July, August, every year. And then as part of my monthly report, things that have movement, things that are being worked on actively, where it, that's what that update is for, is to give you that, that type of update. But for the, this full list of capital improvement, um, just so you can see what's out there, I, my recommendation would be to do it just uh, uh, once a year as it gets approved at, uh, as, the, as the new fiscal year starts. Uh, and then if there's any major changes, of course, we, we could bring that back as well. Um, Commissioner Becker. Uh, then what I might recommend too is that if there's any way when you're doing your regular reports and you're giving us updates on these on a monthly basis, which would be great, um, is that maybe there's some way you can, in the reporting process, sort of tether it back to this so that we can kind of feel like there's a connection between the work that's being done and the original list that we're seeing once a year. Does that make sense? We can do that. Just some, so. some way. Some way like that? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Go. Um, Commissioner Brer, I was, I was just going to say that yearly would probably be, to get anything, you know, substantial, no, I mean, if it's, if it's every month, then we're not seeing much change, but it's good to see, see what, what progresses over a year. So I think we're, we're, we are at a consensus that an annual report about this time each year is fine, but I just would like to say that if there is any material change mm -hmm. in the scope of the projects, either based on, let's say, the city manager taking his big hammer and slamming you and saying, oh, we got to cut out a lot of money, that we'd want to know that. On the other hand, if the city manager says, oh my God, we've got this windfall, we're going to, you need to get some new projects going, we'd want to know that also. So that's why we'll, I, I say a material change sure. in scope. And I think you've gotten some other feedback from uh, the other commissioners as well. So I think uh, that's good, and it's good to see that we have another that we have another update to this picture, which is helpful to us. So, uh, Steve Carrion, uh, you have more. This was just one of your items, right? Correct. Yes. So the uh, the next one was so I was asked to discuss the department's efforts toward CAPRA accreditation. Um, Due to the changes in the department leadership, merging the departments of Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs, there is currently no direct work being done on CAPRA accreditation. 
I say no direct work as we are not actively working on the self-assessment portion of the process. However, uh, Mr. Buell, Travis Buell, who is my deputy director, uh, is well versed in the capital process and with his experience he's helping us set up the program and an organization in a way that when we do restart the accreditation process, it will be beneficial and will be set up for success. Uh, many of the check boxes and processes in the self-assessment portion require that we that they be in place for a period of time. Some of the things on the check boxes we don't even have in place right now. We don't have uh, set up. And so at the present time we feel that staff time and the resources are better spent rediscovering and reimagining the department in order to meet our most urgent short-term goals, which is getting people back into our centers, parks, and sports programs, which is what I mentioned uh, last time. That's one of our, our big goals. Um, so at this point, uh, any questions on the CAPRA accreditation? Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. Chairman, and I just wanted wait, to wait, say wait to Steve. Uh, hold on, Lisa, hold on. Right on. Lisa, hold on, Commissioner McCurdy was speaking. <laughs> I'm sorry. Turn on your mic. I think um, you have done a very good job in doing a good assessment. At this current time, I think that you have the best idea is to try to revision your efforts into getting your department where you can do an assessment at a later date. So I think that's a a good suggestion that since you do not have all the elements together to do an adequate assessment by you reimagining your department, I think that's a good idea. Thank you, Commissioner McCurdy. Uh, Commissioner Sherman, go ahead. Yes, I was just going to agree with our director. We really need to leverage our resources this time and I think that you're right on target with the decision that you made and just wanted to show my it is different when you're a healthcare organization and you need that accreditation to get funding and reimbursement <laughs> but that's not the case and I, I agree with uh, targeting your resource play. thank you Commissioner thank you Lisa any other feedback so uh, when uh, you, Steve, when you and Travis reimagine and restructure and get ready to go, just t so that we don't lose whatever we had before, you guys showed up here. We did have some commissioners, including myself, that had volunteered and actually were identified to subcommittees mm -hmm. to participate with hands-on work to do the assessment. And uh, I would say when we get to that point, let's come back to the commissioners who are willing and able uh, to uh, participate in that area. And you have some people here that actually have been involved in other venues in doing that kind of work. So uh, we, you know, those that wish, of course, would be willing to participate. And I just don't. Forget about that is that, all, all I would say. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that very and, much. And one last thing, because you always know I'm very time bound in terms of understanding schedules. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know there's other pressing issues now, and I agree, getting the centers rolling is a definite big thing. But what in your vision do you see for restarting this? at some point in the future. Is that a 12 month from now, 20 I, month, four month? What I'm, I, am, I am planning right now on a 12 month, starting about 12 months from now. Okay, so maybe, in, so with 12 months to start it up mm -hmm. officially, maybe we can ask for a six month update from now, okay. which maybe would put us in January, mm -hmm. something like that. Does that sound reasonable? Sure, Okay. we, we can make that happen. All right, if there's nothing else on CAPRA, continue with your report, please. All right, the next item is uh, um, Commissioner Schultz presents some information at our last meeting about a memory care program. And I can report that Centennial Hills Active Adult Center is connected with Silverado and they'll be conducting a five-week seminar course starting September 9th. 
uh, and we may look at expanding that to other centers depending on availability and scheduling. So I just wanted to report back to that. Mr. Just uh, follow up on that since you did bring it up at this time. I was going to cover that during the commissioner report. I met with Stephanie at the uh, uh, Centennial Hills Active Adult Center a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I was able to review this program, and they've included me on the six-week program, and it's six weeks, one and a half hours each session. So six times 1.5 will be the number of class hours for the students at that center, and um, it'll be like a pilot session, and it's really preventative to dementia and helping people recognize what they can do to exercise their brain and all that, which is kind of a good thing. And when you think about it, if it's successful, think about the other wards that can also have this because, you know, Ward 6 is not the only place where people lose their memory. I mean, you know, so this is a good thing. And so what I wanted to mention, too, is those of you who maybe want to show up and sit in on one of the classes as a representative, uh, ombudsman of the commission, you're free to do that. Just call Stephanie, who's the leader at that center, and let her know you're coming. And uh, it might be just a good thing for you to see, so you could see how that would apply in your ward, and if you think there's some value of it. So, you know, there's something to think about. And uh, so there are, there, it's actually six defined classes, and it includes everything from the introduction to brain health, uh, importance and overview, physical exercise, cognitive exercise, purposeful, purposeful social activi activities, stress reduction, oh my God, I need stress reduction, and supportive groups and wrap up. So it's a very well-structured program. And just for the people who brought up in the June meeting, uh, the, lead, the person who's doing this for us, she has been told that she's not to solicit business, and this is not to be viewed as a business development opportunity. This is strictly educational in nature only. And I plan on probably being there for session number two, and I'll keep an eye on her and make sure there's no business solicitation occurring. So Commissioner Kurt McCurdy, I'll watch out to make sure there's no hanky-panky, okay? Count on me. So um, with that, I'm happy that we decided to move ahead with that, and I'm looking forward to see how it pilots in Ward 6 and how we can apply it. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Hmm? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. You're so quiet over there. Go ahead, Mita. Just not the date and time. Oh, the date. Yeah, so the, the date and time is, it starts September 9th. It'll be from September 9th from 8.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. And I'll try to make the second session myself. That would be my goal. And that's at the Santana Hills Active Adult Center. Okay, so thank you. Okay, finally, um, I was asked to share the department goals um, that I have put, put together. So the first goal, increase attendance by at least 15% in center programs over the next 12 months through program evaluation and targeted marketing. Number two, increase and develop working relationships with local pro and semi-pro sports teams. We have at least four community events sponsored by a pro or semi-pro team over the next 12 months. Apply for and hopefully receive ORLOP or SNPMA funding for a minimum of three projects in the next round of funding opportunities. Develop maintenance plans for all city regional parks over the next 12 months. These will be followed up by maintenance plans for the neighborhood and smaller pocket parks. And finally, create a high performing organization where people can be entrusted to do their best, feel fulfilled by their chosen career field, and exemplify the city's values of being kind, committed, and smart. Those are my five priorities I'm going to be working on over the next 12 months. Any questions about those? Commissioners? So I like those five goals, and I like the last one especially, because I think that last one will help you achieve all the others. Correct. So, um, Brian, when we see the minutes, will we have this list of five in the minutes? Okay, so there's no need to formally submit that. And I think it would be helpful 
uh, to the commissioners maybe to uh, look at six months from now and say, gee, this, this is what you said you're going to do. How are you doing? Kind of give us a report and tell us, you know, also uh, you may have a mid-course correction saying, oh, there was something else that came up that we should have looked at that and we decided to make that one of the goals and this other one, well, gee, that, you know, wasn't what we really realize it to be. So there's always change. There should. And do you think six months is reasonable? I can certainly do that. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And, and I have to compliment you, Steve, because I had all these things on my list and you covered every one of them. So thank you so much. Thank you. Steve, do you have anything else? No, sir. That concludes my report. Okay. Very good. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. We appreciate that. So we are now at the uh, point of our agenda where we're at agenda item number eight, and that's an opportunity for each of the commissioners to share specific things that are going on in their ward or at large and uh, let us know what's happening. Go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Becker, Ward 2. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, Councilwoman Victoria Seaman is having a breakfast buzz from 9 to 10 a.m. on August 6th, that's this Saturday, at Rachel's Kitchen. That's 9691 Trailwood Drive. Um, that's an opportunity to talk about any War II issues, but in particular, you can always mention parks. I always appreciate that. Um, also, they have coming up um, a little further out. In October 15th, there's going to be an art, another art in the park at Bruce Trent Park from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So you might want to save the date. Right now, they're soliciting for artists. I had an opportunity last uh, late spring to be actually part of that. We actually got a tent for my daughter. Um, I had brought my books, so we did sort of like an author's and artist's tent, and I got to see the perspective from the vendor side. And overall, I mean, it's, it's, it's a small, uh, well-attended event. It's kind of fun. Um, I'd encourage anybody that's art to, to definitely try it out. Um, there's like sometimes a little bit of confusion on the front end as the um, park staff tries to spread out everybody from where they want to be to make sure that it's a nice flowing open area. But after that's done, uh, and, and the residents don't see that part. So the first hour it's set up. Set up gets a little confusing on the front end. But then it sort of smooths out and everything just goes really nice for the rest of the day. Um, outstand the Parks Department does an outstanding job at that. And if you don't have um, if you don't want to have a booth, that's okay. Just save the date and come out and see some art in, in the park. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. I'll Chairman. Do. Yes. Uh, I like to uh, see in all city parks that we can start trying to buy video cam to protect the city and the citizens and I like to see more cameras added in city parks because I know at Doolittle Park we have a lot of, a lot of action going on over early in the morning with the homeless but I think it helped the city marshals out if they had video cameras in every city park. So one day I like to see them apply to the federal government to get some uh, U.S. Justice money to put cameras in the parks. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting recommendation because I know the prior uh, director talked about smart parks and I think part of the smart, smart initiative was uh, surve surveillance you know and uh, is that something Steve that you feel that's something we could talk about and consider uh, sure Steve Ford director Parks and Recreation um, we are actually working with our IT department to deploy uh, cameras in in various parks and facilities uh, we have requests from council offices to do certain facilities our uh, initial uh, Priority was was our swimming pools because of some incidents that were occurring in our in pools. Uh, but I've been working with IT. We're unfortunately um, we are still waiting on cameras that we ordered last November. So we're we we've got the, the the process. We've got a lot of the infrastructure in place. It's just getting the cameras in and installed that is delaying that. But we do have. Uh, a plan for many, many of our parks, maybe not all of them. Um, uh, putting cameras in 84 separate parks, knowing that there'd be multiple cameras in each park uh, gets a little uh, costly, but we do have our, we've been working also with our DPS 
uh, counterparts to find out where there would be the most bang for the buck um, to put cameras in, in many of the parks. I know at Doolittle specifically, we have cameras over on the shack courts, and as we work towards that, uh, getting, getting more cameras on board that, and, and work with the Smart Cities group, um, we are working on it. We're working on the infrastructure. It's just amazing to me that I'm still waiting on cameras that were ordered in November. I, I, I personally think around the bathrooms because we don't need a woman to get raped in a, in a park bathroom. We don't need a man to get molested in the park, around the park bathroom. I'm not saying put them in the bathroom, but I have seen personally where people push women into the bathrooms and try to molest them. So I, I think the city, the city should be tired of paying out money for stuff that they can do preventive maintenance. And then the marshals that are sitting around here can watch those cameras when they're doing, you know, nothing. I, I, I just, I'm just trying to protect my tax dollars. I, I'm tired of, I mean, you know, they got a good agenda item, $64 million that could have been resolved. It could have been resolved a long time ago, but we need to not have lawsuits that the citizens have to pay just because we don't want to buy or invest in cameras. Thank you, Commissioner McCurdy. Okay, other commissioners, do you have any further uh, feedback? Just on that, cameras, if, they, uh, if they're going to be hooked up by some kind of uh, a Wi-Fi network, um, I might recommend, uh, the group, we've talked about this before in other meetings uh, quite a while ago, though, maybe. Um, there's been several youth sports groups that would love to be able to utilize the Wi-Fi so that they can um, broadcast their games to, parents can broadcast games to family members, et cetera, or teams can do that. Uh, all they need to do is that, and in fact, some of the organizations, they even suggested that they would help finance that uh, mm -hmm. if they were asked. So that's just something to throw out there that if there's gonna be Wi-Fi for the cameras, then maybe we could incorporate that for our sports programs, get some opportunities for them to hook up to that so they can broadcast, thank you. That's a good suggestion. Anything else? So I'll just add one item then. Uh, when I, uh, I met on July 12th uh, with Stephanie Rebains, the leader of the Centennial Hills Active Adult Center, to discuss a number of topics and also just to kind of get a feel for what's happening in our active adult centers. And I was very impressed with uh, Stephanie's engagement her energy and uh, her desire really to serve the members. And uh, I sense that they are trying, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in a conversion process where we're going from a program that was subdued to non-existent because of COVID to getting restarted. And I know the Ward 6 community is very much, there's a lot of pent up demand for social activities, mm -hmm. Uh, arts and crafts activities and physical fitness. It's amazing, you normally wouldn't think, but the seniors are very physical fitness oriented, highly. And so it's just very nice to see that. And I would just commend to other commissioners who have uh, active adult centers in your wards that it's good to go out to the local leaders of those centers and just chat with them and update yourself on what the programs are, and also be there. Uh, I periodically they do breakfast. I know in uh, the Ward Six they'll do a, a breakfast or some sort of meal for the uh, people, and that's a big deal because everybody wants to come, and they just love the social engagement. And if you can also to attend some of those as well, because that is really part of our parks and recreation program and an important part. So. That's, I'll zip it now because that was just my little commercial announcement for that. So uh, with there not being anything else then on agenda item number eight, we are on agenda item number seven. I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. Agenda item nine, and that is citizen participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the commission. No subject may be acted upon by the commission unless that subject is on the agenda and is scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward. 
and give your name for the record. The amount of discussion of any sub single subject, as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed, may be limited. So, is there anyone present who wishes to speak? Being that there's no one present that wishes to speak, we will consider that agenda item closed. It is now 5.20 p.m., and we will consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody on the phone, everybody in person, staff, for being here and for speaking and for making this a productive commission meeting. Have a good evening and drive home safe.